Hey, everybody. Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. You are about to hear an incredible episode. Now, look, first off, everybody should know we have basically fully converted over to live shows. Now, the live shows are live. They're a little bit more raw. They don't have all the bells and whistles yet. We're working on improving that part of it. But at this point now, for the most part, you should be able to watch a live version of the shows on YouTube if you go to my channel or John's channel. So that's one note to make real quick. Let's talk about today's guest, John Norris. Um, Well, he's a retired fish and game warden from California also sworn in as a federal agent because sometimes they needed to cross boundaries. Already, that sounds kind of weird. Let me also tell you what this guy's done. He's got a sniper tab on his uniform. He goes into hostile environments to take on drug cartels and has been in gunfights where his crew, members of his crew, have been shot. This happened in basically Los Gatos in California, in the hills. So for those of you listening abroad throughout the world, we don't typically have drug cartel gunfights in the Silicon Valley where computers are invented and software is refined. But this is exactly what John was dealing with because folks come here from other places to try to grow marijuana in California because everything grows in California. And then they put toxic chemicals on it and that kills our wildlife. It kills our land and ultimately kills all of us who smoke it because it's extremely toxic. So I had no idea about any of this stuff. It's akin to the human trafficking problem. So you have folks coming in to California and John and his guys who are tier one operators. I mean, these guys have assets from Air Force para, um, pararescue folks, the PJs. They have uh, training, the same training that SEALs go through in a lot of the specialty schools, sniper training. All of these things go into being able to control this problem and protect wildlife, protect people, protect all these, you know, all these different assets. I had no idea this was happening. Can you, can you sense my shock and, and, uh, and awe at all this stuff? Anyhow, you're going to love this conversation with John. There's a lot out there and you definitely should check out his book. He's got one called Hidden Wars and then a bunch of other ones that he's written subsequent to retiring. I, I can't tell you how much I just, I love what John does and can't wait to bring him back on the show to talk even more about this. Once I get over the shock, I read the book and I'm like, no, what are you talking about? So, so uh, you're going to love this guy. He is fascinating. Here comes John Norris. Real quick, support the show like you've been doing. The show is growing like crazy right now. Thank you so much. Tell a friend. Respond to the posts. Share. Buy the shirts. Buy the books. All of these things help tie into supporting the show. Thank you so much. By the way, Tom Barth, I'm so glad that you're doing well. I thought I'd throw you a little shout out. Tom Barth getting a shout out today. All right. Uh, save the Brave. Save the Brave.org. Here comes John Norris. Get ready. You're not going to believe this. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan East. This is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is retired Lieutenant John Norris, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. Yeah, this is this is pretty cool. You've done the rounds on podcasts. So I appreciate you coming and hanging out here with us. Uh, when when people look at your photo, it looks like, and I really for a long time thought, oh, you're a special forces guy that transitioned after service into being a, a warden. But the reality right. is, you've been or you were a game warden for almost thirty years. Never was you were never a special forces at all in the military. Yeah, Peter, that's absolutely correct. And, and you know, like like we've talked about a little bit before, and to our mutual good friend, Jason Piccolo, who actually connected me to you, and I'm grateful to him and, and you for having me on your show. You don't think of game wardens being special operations personnel or SWAT personnel or, you know, anything along those lines. And, and quite honestly, when I started my career way back in 1992, going to date myself a little bit. Um, I wanted to chase traditional wildlife poachers and do what the traditional game warden does and very important job that we all still do. But obviously that completely changed when this, uh, this drug cartel thing got started throughout the country, especially in my old home state of California, where a law enforcement response of, of tactical operators on the special operations, uh, realm as game wardens was necessary. And I was very blessed to be one of the guys to head up the development of that program and and really expand more effective at stopping damages and destruction to our wildlife or waterways and wild 
lands and protecting our public from heinous uh, violent threats these cartel members pose throughout the entire country. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm grabbing your picture right now as we're talking. When you look at your picture, you're in your compact. You're, and again, it looks like you are in the SF. I mean, you have uh, American flags on both shoulders with the American flags, both of them going forward as always. And you have a tab that says sniper. When I think about, you know, law enforcement folks, yeah, I know there's snipers, but that's for people who like hold up banks and you want to have someone sit on top of a building and, and maybe take out a bad guy. But you're you're a sniper out in the forest. Help me understand that. Yeah, it's kind of a blend. Um, something we realized we needed as game wardens, especially when when fighting the drug cartels or doing anything high risk. Um one thing the public generally doesn't know, and, and they're starting to know a lot more since I've told this story and since we've had a lot more outreach through good podcasts like yours, uh, you know, TV mediums, uh, my new books, things like that, is game wardens are law enforcement officers that enforce every part of the law, every public safety law, like our sheriffs, our police officers enforce. Our specialty is wildlife crimes and, and, and uh, natural resource crimes, but we're sworn in every state. We're also federally deputized, so every game warden in every state acts as a federal agent as well for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we also integrate on things like this COVID-19 pandemic, where we jump in with all first responders. Um, if we had a terrorist attack on American soil, we are a force multiplier trained tactically like every other law enforcement agency. Um, and in addition, many game wardens come from military backgrounds, many in special operations, or they come from other law enforcement agencies where they've been SWAT operators, they've been snipers. Um, I had the the privilege of working in the Silicon Valley where there's a lot of really highly proficient tier one SWAT teams and a lot of military special forces elements there with Moffett Field, with our Air Force and our Army special forces groups. And so while I was doing the traditional realm of my career through the mid 90s all the way up until 9-11 when everything changed for us, um, I was integrating into SWAT training, you know, integrating into sniper schools, becoming a sniper school instructor myself with military and law enforcement instructors. And not the traditional game warden role, but I had an affinity for it. Several people in my agency as well uh, gravitated toward that as game wardens, uh, a retired 20-year veteran of the SEAL teams as an example, who was my assistant team leader and now heads up the cannabis program in California. Um, and then all the guys on the team that you read about hidden more are game wardens first and love grew up hunting, fishing, and just loving the outdoors, Pete. But ultimately they're really good at special operations and tactics. They're really good at hunting bad guys and they're team first with exceptional skill sets and, and talent, but very humble in how they approach that. So we got to build a really awesome team and the sniper element was a big part of that. I want to uh, uh, steal a little bit of uh, Jocko's uh, style here, and I'm going to read from your book. And this, this is a short passage, but... Um, okay. okay, that's cool. Okay, so uh, the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office Marijuana e um, Eradication Team with an allied agency arrest and eradication operation on a Mexican drug cartel, marijuana grown in densely wooded mountains above the Silicon Valley. Okay, if I take out Silicon Valley, you wouldn't even know where we were. Okay, so... While stalking into the grill complex, a heavily armed crew of cartel gunmen ambushed us. And although the uh, gunman only shot, got one shot off before we neutralized them. Neutralized, very nice word. Uh, that one shot hit my young partner through both legs, causing massive damage and blood loss. That does not sound like something that happens within 25 miles of San Jose. Right. Uh, it doesn't California. sound like anything that happens in America. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, 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 it it doesn't add up, man. I mean, you think of that happening on American soil anywhere yeah. to any law enforcement officer, much less us being game warden. It, it doesn't add up. And then you look at the tech capital of the world and you see Silicon Valley as a very safe, an affluent, kind of a high energy, hustling and bustling Mediterranean climate area. And it is all that. what people don't realize is. These drug cartels are hiding in plain sight, as you know now from the books. Um, and because I started everything kind of in Silicon Valley, being a traditional game warden there and integrating with that great team with the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office, their marijuana eradication team, um, we realized there was a much darker thing going on in plain sight of the technology capital of the world. And that was a template for the entire nation. What people need to understand is these groups operating from south of the border are embedded in America. 
They're very well structured. They have a great business model. They're efficient at what they do and very effective. And they're operating in every 50 states on some sort of crime if it's not generating tainted weed for the black market. And it still blows my mind to this day, buddy, to think that, I mean, even though I grew up there and spent the majority of my career there, I'm in Montana now and I'm just reflecting as I tell this story and, and fortunately get to get the message out that it still doesn't compute that it happens that close to to civilization, especially big urban centers. But it, but it's eye opening, you know, and it's it's something we need to know. Yeah, it it is eye opening when you think about. I mean, look, everybody likes to smoke a little bit of weed, you know, no big no big deal, right? Except for when the cartel is like, okay, you're going to make it hard to import this stuff. Everybody grows everything in California. Let's just move there, and now you have this. I'll be nice and say extra legal service <laughs> that has right. the ability to get into <laughs> firefights. I mean, and, and let's be honest, it's illegal, right? Um, but right. It, it, again, it doesn't make sense that this happens. Is this pervasive because California is such a great place to grow things? Or is this also happening in other mountainous areas? And is it tied to the mountains? Yeah, brother, that's it exactly. Med, uh, California is one of only six true Mediterranean climates on the globe. So as you know, being a California guy yourself, yeah. I mean, we have great weather from, I mean, we hardly get any rain really in January in the in the LA basin, the Silicon Valley. Um, our snowpack melts fairly early in the mountains, but the outdoor growing season can really be effective from as early sometimes as late February, March and go all the way. I mean, we've actually eradicated in extreme situations, cartel grows right before Christmas. So California is a weed state. The soil is good. The sunlight's good. The climate, the humidity, all of it's really good. And to your point, yeah, this isn't real. This isn't an anti-cannabis message in any way. As you and I know, California is one of those states that's regulated. And my agency, my old agency, California Department of Fish and Wildlife is one of the main regulators in, you know, legitimate cannabis um, production and sales, as long as it's done correctly. But this isn't about cannabis. This is about environmental crime. This is about a threat to our public safety. So, and we need to remember that these cartel grows in California and 25 to 27 other states throughout the country will never be legal, even in states that legalize recreational and medical weed. It just never will. These are trespass grows on public and private property. Right. Um, uh, they're bringing in, you know, EPA banned highly toxic chemicals from Mexico because EPA banned them in America from being used like 20 years ago because they're so deadly. They're felonies to even possess in the country, and they're in every grow site we see on the cartel front. So this goes far beyond cannabis. This goes wow. into some heinous environmental terrorism, and, and that's not an exaggeration when you talk eco-terrorism because that's really what these groups are doing. Yeah, and I want to get into that, but let me work a little bit on the background because that stuff is definitely fascinating and a big piece of what's in your book too. Uh, just trying to wrap my head around the whole process of here you guys are running around in, I don't know, Ford F-150s or Broncos or something, and you're trying to catch these guys. That means you have to have um, SIGINT, HUMINT, all kinds of INTs to, to know where these guys are. Way back in the olden days, I knew a guy, just a, like this little gypsy of a dude, who would go and make all of his money for the year cooking for the for the growth season up in the northern northern part of California, and he would just he would be cookie for them, and he'd make his forty thousand dollars, and then he would take off the rest of the year until growth season uh, happened again, and he'd come back and cook. So here's this harmless guy. Right. But when I think about as a spy, that's my guy. I want to know that guy. I want to be able to give him a little bit of money so that I can you know infiltrate into the group. So you guys must have collectors of some kind. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and and that's. You know, that gets more into the the kind of traditional thing we had before the cartels got here in California and America in the early 90s. You know, we had the, the semi-recreational grower that wasn't really trying to harm the environment, probably cared about the environment a lot. You know, the, the humble hippie generation, if you will, some of the, the Vietnam veteran era, you know, um, guys in my dad's, you know, generation that, that came back from war and they were just looking to get out in the woods and, and get away from problems and deal with the PTSD and all of that. And then that, you know, I mean, we, we flipped that thing on its lid early nineties when those cartel groups started in San Diego County in the forests and uh, eventually up to Riverside County where I, I saw a grow early on in my career, completely foreign to it. And just on a kind of helping forest service out to see what they were doing on one of those grow raids. And then it just went further and further north, got embedded up in Silicon Valley, L.A. Basin, kept going Oregon, Washington, all the way to the Canadian border. And then they started branching out east and um, completely different from the sedate growers that were just trying to grow 40 or 50 plants off the beaten path 
and uh, divert a little bit of water, uh, you know, to, to make a buck here and there. Whole different game. When you guys go after these folks, it's obviously there's this joint task force. It has to be because you guys ultimately, I'll say, don't care about the illegality of the drug thing. You're really trying to protect the environment and, and the natural wildlife. Not obviously, I'm black and white in something that's very gray, but um, who do, do you partner with FBI then or DEA or ATF or everybody? Yeah, we were kind of partnered up with everybody. In the early days, we were working with the sheriff's department. We were on BLM land. Let's BLM officers and operatives are really good operators in the woods. They're on massive tracts of land. And BLM rangers actually, like Forest Service law enforcement officers or Forest Service rangers, have to cover as much, if not more, ground than we do. So we were integrating with U.S. Forest Service a lot, BLM. DEA would you know, work in, in the weed game a little bit. It and marijuana a lot when we're starting to death amphetamine you know the new fe- uh, synthetic fentanyl that's killing so many people so it was really limited kind of to those agencies and then when we made our first tactical unit that was dedicated to this in, in 2013 um when, like hidden war the new book goes into extensively on how that happened um that's when we started to do our own thing and run our own missions and still work with other agencies, uh, you know, pretty much every day of the week during the grow season. So this was a force multiplier deal. And to your point, Pete, it was, ne- it's never an anti-cannabis thing it really isn't because again, we're in a state talking California that regulates legal and environmentally, you know, cleanly uh, produced cannabis and I noticed when our team developed and I was talking to grower groups and being that first law enforcement guy to go to 500, 600, you know, uh, in, in, in attendance, California Growers Association groups and talk about this issue. It was, it was pretty crazy. You know, they don't take kindly or have been on the run from, from us. But when they saw what I had to say and I put up the PowerPoint and shown some of the graphic pictures that you see in my book, Hidden War, and, and, and different video clips and telling our story and letting them know that, hey, guys, if you're doing it right, we're going to work together. Yeah. This is a team effort. This doesn't have anything to do with cannabis production. This is exactly what we just said. And I was actually very much blown away by the positive response I got from so many growers. Uh, some of them in the audience during these presentations were in tears because they love their environment. They love their waterways. They don't like to see animals, you know, die a heinous death from toxic nerve agent poisons and everything else. And we actually got a lot of um, offers from these growers to help us clean up cartel growth sites, uh, putting up money in foundations and actually terming our marijuana enforcement team and our sniper unit, their earth warriors, which I never saw coming. But being a unifier and want guys anything, especially in uh, the gray California politics, this was a real to have the left and the right kind of come together on one one major issue, and that is what this is doing to our environment, our public safety as Americans. Forget where you sit on the cannabis use, don't use, for or against, uh, left, right. It doesn't matter. This is this is about humanity and, and purity of environment and safety. And fortunately, that's what we're starting to see as both sides come together more and more on this issue as they become aware of it. This unity of effort doesn't follow uh, the standard narrative. I mean, look, you and I are Californians. We know you go far enough north, you're going to run into the state of Jefferson, which is not a not recognized state, but it's definitely a, I guess you would say, a libertarian stronghold where folks don't want a lot of federal government in their business. Um, these are not people that you would think to be right. you know, earth-loving hippie folks, and yet here they are working with you guys to repair and repulse, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you know, coming from California, like yourself, um, I, I think I bring a more of an open mind to the whole, to the whole issue nationally and being, being up in Montana now, but still doing a lot of work and having family and friends and a lot of business in California, because I love California and everything that that great state has mm. from the standpoint of wildlife resources and habitat. I mean, California is just a beautiful state, as you know, there's, we have everything. Yeah. And I could not have had a more blessed and diverse career working in California as a game warden versus other states, because California has a little bit of everything. And politically, it's, it, you know, you're kind of juggling a lot of balls there. And, and like you said, that that libertarian concept that you don't have in other states, um, I think, brings a more open mindedness to the issue. And we look at it beyond drug abuse or, you know, cannabis use or, or any of this thing or, or you know, the, the political gains or not gains of regulating and taxation and, yeah. you know, funding these industries, we get to a bigger issue and we, we have to look at that bigger issue. And then something I talk about in the new book, as you know, in Hidden War is, especially at the end of the book, is if you're going to regulate cannabis as an example, 
Um, is the problem going to go away with the cartel? We quickly learned that didn't happen at all in any state. We're regulating. So it gets, when you look at the politics of regulation, right, wrong, or indifferent, it's not so much regulation or not. It's how are we regulating? What type of laws are enacted? What type of incentives are there to curb the cartel threat, to eliminate that market, and to clean up the damage they're doing? Because that's the imprint we're most concerned about. Not the growth side itself at first. That's certainly a bad thing because all that tainted weed gets in the black market and is sold all over the country yeah. to unsuspecting consumers ingesting that crud. But it's what's left what's left behind in that superfund site, right? On that waterway and that poisoned uh, growth site and the trash and all of that. It's just a it's just a hot mess, man. And California's the hub of it. So Yeah, and I guess if you're not of the right generation, you think Superfund site, oh, that must be wonderful. No. <laughs> It's, it's the opposite of one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is like a toxic dump, you know, like a wasteland. Yeah. Some of these gross sites remind me of, you know, some of these like fallout wastelands you can't go in. They're just a, an absolute mess and not safe to be in. We're going to get to all of the environmental stuff in a second for everybody listening. I just have to get into one more aspect of, of what you do because it is so abnormal. When you are going to private training or joint training, um, you know, as an operator, I mean, that's fully what you are. What kind of, um, look, you don't have a bona fides. You're like, Hey, I'm a game warden. I shoot ducks. And you're at sniper right, school. Right. So is there a chip on your shoulder? And, uh, what, what is the reception? Like, I mean, at least initially, obviously you guys go out and you hold your weight and they're like, Oh, okay. You really are able to do this stuff. But talk about that, um, introduction to that world because you know, it, it's tough, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's that's not a free uh, ride. <laughs> it's not a free ride at all, man. And that's I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question. And, and I do talk about this a little bit, especially in the new book, because to me, that was the biggest challenge. It was I'm a game warden. I'm an outdoor guy. I've grown up hunting and fishing, a lot of field craft skills, you know, embedded in me from dad and granddad and my uncles from like six, seven years old. So all of those skills are what really make good operators as far as snipers, as far as trackers, as far as, you know, um, assaulters, whatever, in the military or SWAT units. But I will say this. When I went to my first sniper school in the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office, myself and Mark, my, my longtime partner and teammate on the Met, they kind of looked at us fun crazy. They're yeah. like, you guys are game wardens, man. What are you doing in sniper school? And I mean, this was when our agency wasn't in the mindset at all, well before special operations was a deal where we could even have a sniper unit or even have a MET unit, right. um, even have the tactical gear, right? And so we, you know, we had built our own Remington 700 PSS sniper rifles and got our own scopes and got our match ammo. Now we had been hunters and hand loaders since we were kids. So we had a lot of gun knowledge and we could shoot proficiently. And the bottom line is when you get to a school like that, it doesn't matter what patch you have on your shoulder. If you're a team guy and you're humble and you're helping out and you're carrying your weight or you're exceeding doing more than the other guys in the class are doing and you're, you're hustling between, you know, shooting strings and running to the target, not, you know, walking to the target to check your hits and you're, and you're shooting well, that, uh, that respect instantly is there. And you're not, you're not, you're not looked at like, Oh, you're the, you're the burden bunny cop. What, what are you, you know, what are you doing? You're, you can't be a sniper. So that first school Pete, and, and I'll never forget that was, that was in 2000. That was right before nine 11 hit. Um, and a good friend of mine, and I've talked about him in other podcasts, John Spagnola was a sergeant at the time and becoming a sniper on his agency in that same school as a student. And he saw Mark and I shooting and we were shooting well and he was shooting well and we instantly bonded that day. And I think because of what he later became as a sniper team leader for the for Santa Clara County Sierra team, bringing us in, seeing what we could do, that gave us credibility and respect with all these other tier one SWAT teams throughout the Bay Area and so we were informally building the building blocks, putting them in, in, in place, if you will, to build the MET unit, to build a sniper unit of our own when the time was right. And that was literally about a decade later. But that's where it started. And if you show up and you do your part and you shoot really well, people start taking game wardens really seriously. And then when you start going into the woods to back them up, if they have to go on a rural call and they're used to doing the flatland city stuff, and, you know, game wardens are quiet in the woods. They can survive in the woods by themselves. They all hunt and fish. They can track uh, human tracks and animal tracks really well. And there's a lot of benefits to that. So it kind of becomes, you know, joint training. We're mm -hmm. learning from them. They're learning from us. We're kind of seen as equals. And now we're just partners and brothers and sisters. We're not, you know, lesser cops within a realm that are just kind of showing up to play soldier or whatever some people might think. But there were some growing pains to get to that point. 
and we just had to kind of be bold and, and jump in with both feet and let those agencies host some good schools. If they would take us, we would go and work our asses off and prove ourselves. Um, and then we would bring something back to the agency after that. And it was, it was a long process, but a real fun one. And I'm, I'm glad I was part of it. I love that you talked about that because I was reading about that in the book and I'm like, that's such an easy thing to not even cover. And because like a lot of, um, I'll use MARSOC guys, for example, Marines have yep. special forces. They're badass dudes, but great MARSOC guys. I absolutely. Mean, yeah, good. Yep. Outside of the immediate community, they're not really known. So they often have a chip on their shoulder and they're some of the baddest people you'd ever run across. But just yeah. because, and like pararescue guys from the Air Force, again, these guys are incredible. They're like a defensive offensive tool and they're incredibly fit. But if you don't know, you just don't know. And, and so it's easy it's easy to earn your way in if you do the work. Like uh, me, like when I'm doing my spy stuff, right? You show up at, at a, a, a site unannounced to some SEALs, to some right. Green Beret, Delta, whoever it is. And you're like, I'm here to help. They're like, Roger, your rack's over there. And you're like, you're pointing at the ground. <laughs> but yeah, you do yeah. your work and all of a sudden they're like, hey, Pete, come over here. What do you think about this? You know, and you, you get brought in pretty quickly, but you have to prove it. You know, like, but that's honestly, that's true for the SEALs too. Like if a, if a new SEAL shows up, you get the benefit of the doubt because you've got a trident on your chest, but uh, you have to do the work. You can quickly lose that bona fides by not performing. Yeah, and I've been – you know, you talk about the SEALs and you talk about MARSOC and the PJs. And the cool thing is I've been very, very blessed to work with all of those groups, and I have a lot of close friends in, in those communities. And, I mean, like Moffett Field and the PJs and their rescue wing, yeah. the 129th. I mean, they were right there in Moffett Field. They became, you know, a force multiplier. We did tons of missions together on the cartel front. Um, I've worked with a lot of SEAL team members and both retired and active duty and having a SEAL team member, you know, on our MET team. Yeah. Um, not, another great operational group. And again, always open-minded that if you go there and prove yourself, you're in. And, and you know, doing the tactics mm -hmm. and the small unit work that we did with and without canines on the MET unit – it is the same stuff that the small special forces units do in small group operations, whether it's MARSOC, whether it's Delta, whether it's, you know, special forces, SEAL teams, the PJs, it's all the same stuff. Yeah. We don't reinvent the wheel. We might customize it a little bit for our particular environment, you know, there in the foothills of California and how we use our canines because we don't have as many assets and as many bodies necessarily as a military team. But when it comes down to the tactics and the training, what we were learning from the global war on terror, GWAT, you know, after the 9-11 incident and what those guys were bringing back when they were coming off of deployment and going into like the counter drug task force with the National Guard and things like that. We were working in real time and learning from military spec ops veterans that were deployed in Afghanistan for six months and coming back to the Silicon Valley and working counter drug with us. So when we would share ideas and information, we were on the same page. So we were just able to take those tactics and that directive domestically to fight a domestic threat while well, they were overseas, you know, fighting that terrorism, um, international threat. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was good to get in that mix, but at the same time you had to prove yourself. And a lot of guys do look at you a little skeptical, like, who are you, man? Yeah. And then it, here's my other question too, is if you're operating, you know, in a dangerous environment, uh, like so let's say North of Lake Almanor by the feather river or somewhere up in, by Mount Lassen, there's a whole right. lot of nothing up there. So if something happens, are, is it PJs that come and get you guys out if you're stuck on the side of a mountain, you know, chasing some bad guy? Or is that is that an internal asset where they life flight you out or do whatever that is to rescue you? You know, it all depends on where we're at and what our uh, what our air support options are. Generally speaking, and, and I go into this in the first book especially, and more in the woods, after that first gunfight, we learned a lot and there were a lot of things during that event when our partner was shot and we were holding that perimeter and pinned down for about three hours before he got an air rescue for him. And we were so close to losing him because of the long delay in air support. What our administration and what the sheriff's office administration didn't realize is you can't bring a life flight helicopter, which is basically an ambulance with a blade right. and land it on a mountainside, right? You need a big landing zone. And in this case, it was, it was a church parking lot uh, uh, down below on a road called Hicks Road in Silicon Valley below Los Gatos. But we learned then that had we had more communication and been working with the PJs and the 129th uh, PAPOC teams at a Moffett Field, those guys were like, hey, man, we have our birds spooled up anytime you guys are on a mission. If we're not on that mission with you, we will be there within 30 to 40 minutes max 
We have hoist capability. We'll fly into a hot zone. Their military team, of course, they're going to fly into a hot zone. Yeah. The Coast Guard will fly into a hot zone. The California Highway Patrol, as an example, have a hoist capability out of their bigger ship and a medic. They're another law enforcement bird. They're going to come into a hot zone. But like Cal Fire that rescued us that day, some of these you know, other fire agencies or surveillance agencies or even law enforcement agencies that have helicopters and the Silicon Valley is full of them, none of them have capability to rescue anybody on the ground and they won't fly into a hot zone. So having a military asset of Moffett Field there in California and then Mather and all the different bases in Northern California, Southern California, it's interesting to think that California has so many good domestic military resources that are working domestically to support our operations on the ground. And that changed the game for us of where we went with ops plans um, we always had a backup within 30 minutes if, if we had ever had a, another horrible incident like the shootout in 2005. So we're, we're much better equipped now, but um, that's a really good point you bring up in. You have to have the same air assets that you do almost in wartime overseas to do this type of job. And that's why game wardens became special operations professionals. So we could stay safe doing it because we were undergunned. You know, we were outnumbered, we were under equipped and we were under supported when this thing started. And that's something after that first gunfight that I informally tried to push and develop for the agency and having good leadership like Nancy Foley and Mike carry on later, the two good chiefs that saw that we needed to stay in this game, even though we were getting a lot of political pressure and even internal traditional minded, you know, administrators in our own agency saying what the game wardens don't need to be doing marijuana jobs. That's garbage collection. Why are we out doing drug cases? They weren't seeing the bigger picture environmentally, and it just wasn't a comfortable place in their mind for us to go to be a progressive agency. And a lot of us thought differently, and now we do it all. So well, we're very lucky to be more diverse, I think, and, uh, and, uh, and have something we've learned through growing pains and making a lot of mistakes to save other states the same problem as they're learning. And that's what I'm doing on the national circuit now is working with other agencies, whether they're game wardens, uh, wildlife agencies, narcotics departments, and speaking all over the country right now to push that thin green line conservation message and also say, guys, let me tell you all the mistakes we made, all the political, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, stumbling blocks we had to overcome, all the training, all the equipment, all yeah. the tactics, the stuff with canines, especially brother was we, we learned, you know, the hard way taking two, three years to get our canines dialed in before we had, you know, a one strike dogs doing it right that other agencies were starting to learn from. Um, we can we're just saving the rest of the country a whole lot of time and a whole lot of resources in reinventing the wheel. And it's it's really cool to be part of that because we're we're also passionate about America, yeah, and everything that this great country has environmentally and what our people are, no matter what side of the political fence you sit on. And it, it's interesting. I'm it's such a bad situation with this COVID-19 pandemic we're in right now, but I'm glad you and I are talking during it because now I look at what's happening to the outdoors now Yeah, without patrol forces, right? Without game wardens out there, without law enforcement able to respond. I mean, it's free reign open season and the cartels aren't stopping. You and know, they don't this care is, about the flu. They don't care about the flu brother. And you know what? Every crisis is there. It's like their golden wishing yep. well. They just take advantage of this situation and go it is free market let's go everybody's yeah. tied up and distracted um i got you there yeah yeah it just yeah I, <laughs> because every because of covid everybody's on these things and sometimes it gets a little jumpy so uh yeah i i hear you and you're right oh yeah yeah everyone's swamming the net <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so when it comes to like terrorism and things like that their biggest vulnerability, and this goes for for narco terrorists, environmental terrorists, any kind. They're most vulnerable when they're moving to try to operate. Like that's when they can when they when they're scoping yes, sites exactly. and doing. And so right now, that's like their biggest concern. They're probably, I would guess, as a collector and operator, that they're more active out there trying to get the spots and and trying to operate so they can pick the next thing or move quickly. So you're you're right about that. Let's talk a little bit about you said earlier you were talking about toxic chemicals. Um, I think about all yeah. of the so so just this week we had a company called Hemp Wave on and one of the things they're trying nice. to is is get in front of the farming process so that farmers um, can one catalog where their crop comes from 
and and say, hey, you know, in this region, there's a lot of arsenic in the soil. And so instead of cratering the whole economy, that one silo gets dealt with and you and you do some, you know, you treat the soil or whatever it's going to be to deal with because hemp tends to gather in all of the heavy, nasty stuff like arsenic, mercury, all that kind of stuff. So they're working on trying to, you know, provide a baseline so we know what 0.05 something of something is. Uh, we know like this area has a government compliant product instead of these atypical things so that we all, you know, like, it's funny, like we always want to say like GMOs and knowing what you put in your body, but we'll put anything on our body from right. GNC. We'll smoke any weed. You know, it's like, right. Like there's no problem. So talk a little bit about yeah. this. Like we, I love the environment. I'm all about it. We've had Dr. Steven nice. running on the show a couple of times. He's a, a, U, a UM guy. He's a he's a professor emeritus. He's a climatologist, and he's the most practical awesome. guy yeah. ever. He's like, hey, not everybody can ride their bike to, to work. I can. I live five miles from work. I live in Missoula, you know. But right. this stuff is some heavy, heavy stuff. And you're not doing like the big long-term like save the ocean. You're like right now – where this poison is happening, where these animals are dying, where this water is being diverted, we're acting. So give us the whole lay down on all of that stuff. Yeah, the one thing is, and to your point on, on on the hemp groups, you know, really looking at what is being absorbed into the weed that's going on the, the legitimate market. Right. I'm really glad to see groups doing that. I'm seeing so many organic farmers and, and you know, the, the certification and the testing of, of organic versus, you know, any type of pesticide far more sedate than the stuff I'm going to talk about in a minute, but even our cannabis industry in California are leaps and bounds ahead of where they were two or three years ago, even when we first started regulation. And that's been a real positive side of the regulation side of seeing everybody environmentally conscious um, from the ground up. On the cartel side, though, you're looking at you know chemicals that we created in this country um, for ag- legitimate agriculture back in the 50s and the 60s. And it, products like carbofuran, metafos, furan, that basically are nerve agents and they're anticoagulants. And they're made to keep any insect, any animal, you know, anything off of a plant to harm that plant, you know, before consumption and harvest. So uh, the stuff was deemed completely unsafe, even in way diluted doses on our crops uh, 20 years ago by the EPA. So they were banned from general use throughout the country by the EPA. And then the California Penal Code and and other codes throughout the country have made it a felony even to possess these chemicals without special licensing and to have them on private or public property. So they're not available in the US, but they are available in third world countries. They're hubbed in Tijuana where the cartels get them in Tijuana. And that's the one thing besides their growers smuggle across the border illegally because all the infrastructure, the grow locations, um, the infrastructure for water diversions and camping gear to sustain a grow site and growers, it's already in place on this side of the border by inner American uh, cartel operatives. But the banned poisons, which is kind of their, you know, it's kind of their their golden ticket to making really effective weed without having animals eat the bud or, or tamper with it. They're bringing that stuff across. I mean, hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. They're bringing that stuff across, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of gallons of this stuff every grow season, um, annually, every year, and it's getting on all the plants. And to put it in perspective, Pete, it's, this is kind of one of those stats that, that still is very alarming. Uh, a 12-ounce bottle of furidan, let's say, which is a crystal-like powder substance, was originally designed to be diluted with like 5,000 gallons of water before it was sprayed on any agricultural plant, you know, in America. And even when EPA did all of the testing on that, it was still deemed too toxic to be on our, our agricultural crops for consumption by Americans. What the cartels do is they take a whole bottle of this stuff and they pour it into a three to five gallon backpack sprayer with three to five gallons of water. And they go out and just spray that thing all over their 10 foot plants, their two foot plants. It's in the soil, it's in the water. Um, I mean, they're getting exposed to this stuff. They're being toxically poisoned, but it's keeping everything off. And then after a couple of days, this stuff looks like kind of like like a white sheen, almost like liquid paper or bird droppings on a plant leaf. It starts to dry out and dissipate and get just kind of clear. And pretty soon you can't even tell it's on the plant. 
but it's embedded inside the plant, inside the leaves, inside the bud that people are smoking and ingesting, the root system, super nasty stuff. I mean, one container of this stuff, if you took that that crystal powder in one container and put it in equal doses on, on a flat table uh, and everybody ingested an equal dose of just a few crystals, it would kill over 2,600 people within 20 minutes. Um, a 400 pound black bear from two tablespoons of this stuff has a nervous reaction to seizure and, you know, respiratory failure within a couple of minutes. So wow. the, the amount of dead animals, tainted animals we see is flipping crazy in the grow sites. Give, give us an idea of what that is. I mean, flipping crazy, give, be more graphic than that, please. No, that's, uh, I'm glad you asked that. So for instance, we would go into a, a massively toxic site, say a 20,000 plant grow with carbofuran on all the plants and at the base of all the plants in the waterways. And we see somewhere in the neighbor, neighborhood of 25 dead cottontail rabbits, uh, wow. blue jays, red tail hawks. You might see a black bear or two killed. You might see a deer. We've seen gray fox. We've seen mountain lions, which is a protected animal, as you know, in yeah. our my old home state of California, um, especially during those drought years we had back, you know, the mid mid 2015 era. Yeah. Um, so we started to see that. Now, when we started working this stuff, the thing that was just crazy is we didn't know this stuff was on the plants or how deadly it was. So for years, we were <laughs> we were raiding these 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 uh, you know grow sites. We were tackling and having foot chases and fights with growers that were armed, but also had a backpack sprayer this stuff on. I'll never forget doing a downhill run behind Mount Hamilton in, in uh, Silicon Valley on an armed grower that was running away from me with his backpack sprayer on and tackling him and rolling around with his sprayer flopping all over the place. And thank heaven it didn't breach or burst or spray because yeah. I would have been contaminated. We just didn't know what was going on. And that was that was back in those early Santa Clara Met days. But when we started to learn how bad this stuff was, we had a couple of federal officers on the, the um, uh, Forest Service side that were exposed in a state back east and almost died from it. Um, we had some officers in California that were on our camp program, our, our annual helicopter eradication uh, teams with Department of Justice that were exposed. And they weren't hospitalized, but headaches, you know, um, wow. sinus failure, just things like that, um, and, and going through the protocol. So protective protocol for the, for the federal level and the state level has grown uh, 20-fold since in the last five years we're really careful we do blood tests several times a year as operators to find out if this stuff's in our in our system at all or we've been exposed our canines we've had canines die of leukemia and other cancers uh at very early ages when they were completely healthy with great genetic breeding backgrounds and in their prime at two or three years old and suddenly die within a month and contract a leukemia or another cancer yeah. we can't prove that it's due to these poisons but we're pretty pretty certain it is yeah. um so pro pro protecting our canines has become another major officer safety issue and and some standard operating procedure stuff we're implementing right. in the grow sites it, it's just an eye-opener and the worst part about it is 70, 80 percent of the black market weed um, sold, distributed and ingested all over the Midwest, the eastern seaboard, the big cities comes from these cartel grow sites. And it all has this carbofuran on the bud. It's, it's not just some of it. If it comes from a cartel grow site, they're using this stuff. It is their you know, successful operating procedure for business. And it's out there. So. You may not, you're not going to get sick and die right away from it because it's dissipated. It's it been absorbed. It, it's not obvious on the plants or the buds, but you are ingesting an anticoagulant. You're ing in, ingesting a nerve agent that some of the active ingredients were developed by the Nazis in World War II for their, for basically for their, you know, their bio weapons and nerve yeah. agents warfare program. It's the same stuff that's in this product. And we're ingesting that stuff. Our kids are experimenting with it. Medical patients are using it back East and they just don't know. And the cartels are taking advantage of that demand um, at the expense of health and human safety and making hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of black market profit off of it. And that to this day just has to enrage all of us as of Americans that we're being taken advantage of and manipulated within our own borders by these yeah. groups while they're getting rich off of it and are and at the expense of our wildlife. <laughs> yeah, it is absolutely infuriating that they're destroying the wildlife, destroying yeah. the environment and poisoning all of us. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons why, you know, if we had a uh, more universal legality of, of marijuana, you know, these things are harder to work just because, and I guess, We'll talk a little bit about this, but just because California and, and Colorado and Washington, you know, these places are a lot more permissive and, and have the legality thing pretty much covered with marijuana. It doesn't mean there's not a market in 
fill in the blank other state. And so California is a massive state. Like it's sometimes I, I, if I drive near the Gulf Coast, I'm like, oh, Alabama's over. Like it's so fast because it's, there's such small <laughs> like, places. Yeah. I mean, right, right, right. It, you could be in the middle of nowhere, which is next to the middle of nowhere, which is next to the middle of nowhere. I mean, think about Yolo County and how tall right. and it goes on forever. So these, right. you can literally grow a lot of weed and just be damn near impossible. How in the heck do you guys cover all of that space to find? And then how many are there of you? I mean, California is the third biggest state. So you should have a massive a brigade. 5,000 dudes probably couldn't cover that much space. Yeah, that that's always the issue, brother, is, you know, we're a team of 12 on a good day and a couple 12, of canines 12. and we're covering the entire state. So, yeah, it, it's, we're not a big team. Um, we're an effective team. There's a lot, there's a lot, a lot of effectiveness in that little unit, but the, the thing that's really makes it work is, you know, our group of thin green line citizens out there. Not law enforcement officers, not game wards, not drug agents, not sheriffs, not BLM rangers or forest service LEOs, but basically, you know, guys like you and me that yeah. love the outdoors, that hunt, fish, hike, um, you know, pro cannabis users and growers have become great informants. And I call that the thin green line force multiplier. Now, everybody that's in that realm that love our outdoors and love our country are part of the thin green line. It's not just a military law enforcement thing anymore. And I, I don't use that term lightly. And the reason is without everyone's help of being on the lookout for this stuff on their own property or when they're hiking in the woods, we're not going to find it all. We're, we're not going to find even a smidge of it, you right. know, a very small percentage. And, you know, um, that tainted product is going to make it out of the woods because it won't get interdicted by any law enforcement and more people will be poisoned by this stuff. And more wildlife will die, more water will be poisoned and, and diverted and polluted. So it's really up to you, me, and everybody right. um, to, to be part of that thin green line solution because you're right. We can't cover it all, and California is a massive state. And as you know, I mean, we've had growth sites on the eastern Sierras, no exaggeration, at 10,000, 11,000 feet yeah. you know, in golden trout wilderness area. And then we've had them literally in an eye shot of the surf of Monterey County of the Pacific Ocean breaking the beach and not far from the beach and everywhere in between. So, um, and then 25 to 27 other states have had it granted to a lesser degree because they have smaller plots. They don't have the growing season we have in California and they don't have as much land, but states in the Midwest. And, you know, you mentioned the point of regulating federally and how certain states are regulating what's really happened there. Ironically, in most of the states that have regulated of how they've structured the regulation, that's when the black market cartels are coming in to undercut legitimate cannabis. You know, and obviously legitimate cannabis is going to cost you a little more money because it's got to be inspected. It's got to be, you know, there's enforcement. Um, it's you not know, doused in uh, poison. It's not doused in poison. You know, it's taxed. It goes through the normal business model. It, it's not just, you know, um, yeah. field to, to table, if you will, you know, all over. So this this uh, cartel generated weed is really high in THC content. It's really effective. People love it. It's, pr it's really cheap compared to legitimate, organic, tested, uh, vetted, verified cannabis. And it just undercuts the legitimate market because it, it makes that black market thrive because of demand. Is this where you plug your new line of weed cigarettes? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have, I have a lot of thin green line products, but they, they don't involve cannabis. <laughs> I think but you're missing I, I an opportunity here. I'm terrified <laughs> of the other stuff now. <laughs> oh, I know, man. A lot of people have said that, no joke. But, you know, I when we talk federal regulation, that that's something that has to be looked at as a solution for sure. Yeah. And it has to be uniform. I mean, I mean, something I've talked about on some other pod, Joe Rogan and I got into this quite a bit on his podcast, obviously being a pro cannabis guy and, and really looking at that issue. Joe looked at it very objectively and very sensibly. Um, and he puts out a good message with that. Uh, but we got to look at not only regulating, but how are we regulating? Yeah. You know, are we, are we helping or, or, you know, inflaming the black market for cannabis? Yeah. Are we making, you know, adjoining states to a state that regulates now a complete black market state based on legitimate stuff slipping across state lines illegally? And you're right. We can't piecemeal it throughout the country. We have to have a national solution, brother. Yeah. And we have to all adhere to some guidelines to get that, to get the back of the cartel broken and have enough organic safe product out there for those that want to consume it the right way 
and 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 just take that demand yeah. away from the black market. And we're a long ways from that, unfortunately. This it, it's going to be a while because we're just uh, we're piecemealing it individually, state by state. We're not looking at it federally, and people have mixed reasons or they have mixed feelings on it, as you know. How much should the feds get involved? Can the states do their own thing, right. especially in our old state of California, how we like to operate? And I don't think that's a good solution. I don't think that's going to get us anywhere to solving this problem anytime soon. It's going to be a, a lot more years before uh, we finally get there. We, and, you know, these numbers never work as smoothly as we want them to work. But if you look at all of the death and destruction that's caused by a tainted marijuana product, it's got to cost more per bud. It's just that cost is spread in, in human lives and, you know, wiping out whole populations of rabbits. And granted, rabbits can hump all day, but... You know, we can't continue to kill them indefinitely. <laughs> How about black bears? And and it's already hard enough right. for any of the mountain lion family of cats to survive, especially in California. I mean, they're they're trying to build bridges for these things so they can get from one population area to the next for them, their population area, uh, because you know the inbreeding that happens. It's just it's already hard yeah. enough for these things to survive. Um, yeah, it's it's shut. <laughs> It's shocking that this is happening in our own borders. It's man. And, and by the way, yeah. Thanks for thanks for doing that. Thanks for taking on that risk, going into unknown spaces, and uh, you know, tackling people with chemicals. Holy shit, man! Thanks for doing. Thank you for your service. You know, Pete. Thanks so much, and and not only for the support, and and, and we all on the Met and, and in, in the Game Warden Thin Green Line front appreciate that support from you, but. I want to put that thanks back on you for being part of that thin green line through a podcast format through live broadcast, because I noticed until I retired and we got this second book out and I could speak a little more freely without political, you know, constraints in yeah. California or whatever, but being able to take it nationally and spread the word nationally, how much more effectiveness we're having in education in policy in training and outdoor safety. And really that's going to solve the problem a lot more than just uh, one team running around in California, making a dent, Right. So thank you for it. Thank you for the support. And you hit a really good point that we don't talk about and uh, very few people look at is what are the costs to American taxpayers yeah. for this cartel threat? And you hit it on the head. When one growth site goes into a national forest and they trash that, that growth site, think of the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars it takes for the game wardens, the Forest Service LEOs, all the allied agencies to come together, the helicopters they need not only to go eradicate that, oh that poison product safely with all the hazmat yeah. PPEs and hazmat protocol we got to have, and then officer safety and tools and equipment and training and salaries that goes into guys like me and my team members and everybody on that front. And then you got the cleanup, right? You got those rec reclamation phase, we call, we call it the garbage collection phase, and some people think it is, the dirty job. That's really the most important part because it's getting all that crap out of the forest and restoring the waterways. You mentioned endangered species and you hit it on the head with the mountain lion, but we have the Pacific Fisher that was almost right. extinct that Dr. Murad Gabriel and Greta and IERC, that group, that, that NGO group that works closely with us, actually got scientific data on the last couple of years. And we were so close to losing that animal because of just gr cartel growth sites in California. And then the steelhead trout fishery, right. you know, red-legged, yellow-legged frog, all these sensitive species that people don't realize are on the chopping block to almost be extinct. One growth site could decimate a whole population for a quarter of the state or more. The costs are millions of dollars um, for just a few growth sites when you finally get to the end of that chain of that reclamation cycle. And it is costing us a ton of money and a, and a, and a ton of environmental destruction. So we got we need to think bigger scope right and you just hit it on the head yeah. and and driving that point hope really helps so thank you for that yeah well i mean i i know when i was in the army you'd be in the brigade staff room and there's let's say there's 40 people in the staff meeting you've practiced it twice right um, right i'm not cheap nobody in that room is cheap we all have secondary degrees right. And so these are literally million dollar meetings, you know, as you sit there. And so every time you guys have to plan this operation, you're talking multiple million dollar hours, you know, because having that helicopter on station with people qualified yep. that can fly. Oh, by the way, there's a storm and all of these assets are brought to bear on this one tiny little right. piece of California. It is fantastically. Anytime you put anybody in a helicopter, it's half a million dollars. Easy, easy. You know, like it's just. Yep. Just add, add those zeros. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, blade time, it, it's, it's just, it, it baffles me what, what a helicopter costs yeah. to run for a day. 
And then all the money, like you just said, around it for weeks to build up to that, yeah. that operation, landing zone, fuel trucks, oh logistic support, um, yeah. picking out the right LZ. And, you know, we're and a thousand dollars an hour is like the bonus cost of a yeah. ship for a day <laughs> of just, just fuel and operating the, the hour they operate. So and, and everything's helicopter based, as you yep. know, you know, I mean, just like the military, we, we thrive on air support. We cannot do an effective job of, of cartel hunting and, and cannabis eradication oh and, and all this reclamation without great air assets. And, you know, 90% of those assets are, are, are ships, they're airships, they're helicopters. And it's, uh, it's a lot of money that we're trying to actually fund outside of agency funding right now through NGOs, through foundations, um, grower groups, conservation groups, uh, patriotic groups, you name it. We run out of money every year on the, on the helicopter funding front to get the job done. And we don't completely get it done because of those costs. So that's something people don't realize, I think. Are you guys federal agents or are you guys California? We're California state agents under, under basically, you know, the governor's office. Right. Um, statewide and then we're also federally deputized and we have federal ids from u.s fish and wildlife service to be deputized to handle anything interstate or across state lines as needed so we uh we're sworn and paid by the state but we have federal authority as well as u.s fish and wildlife agents kind of adjunct to, to the federal agents that are assigned federally when we uh when we make our movie um you know the fictionalized version of this and and some guy like we'll say you know Bo Darvel dr- bandit driving his Trans Am I'm driving my Trans Am yeah when he's like ha ha he drives from Susanville across into Nevada you're gonna take your yep. hat that says California fisherman you're gonna go now yep. I have my federal hat on you're still under arrest yep <laughs> yep I'm just gonna change ball caps man just like <laughs> hey you know game wardens are jacks of all trades anyway we do so many odd uh, you know uh, <laughs> so many unique jobs we, we have no problem changing our hats we'll do whatever we can to, to protect our wildlife yeah yeah but I left the state good now yeah. it's a federal crime <laughs> Stuff <gonna cut> you. <laughs> right right hey man listen I appreciate you coming on and, and spending this time with me especially during crazy ass covid season it's uh it's a remark and a remarkable tale, and I just had I literally had no idea. I've been learning about human trafficking and how devastating yeah. that is, and then all this stuff with the cartels in California and other places. Just the environment, it just blows me away that this is, you know, it's it's just it, yeah, I'm blown away by all of this uh, realization, and I appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah. No, thanks a lot for having me. And um, to your point on human trafficking, something I haven't mentioned in this broadcast yet is. We need to remember that these uh, cartel groups that are running the tainted cannabis operations throughout all of America, they're from the same groups and same families that are that are human trafficking in all 50 states. They're producing methamphetamine yeah. in the winter when you can't grow weed. They're into fentanyl production. They're in, there is some gun running in certain states. We've narrowed down this infrastructure of cartel groups to you know, every criminal enterprise they can be in for profit, human trafficking is right up there yeah. with, with the drug trade, as you know. It's heinous, man. So when we're stopping one group, you know, from poisoning our wildlife and wildlands on a cartel grow, we're actually hitting that group effectively to take a chunk out of some of their efforts on human trafficking for that particular cell and for methamphetamine production. So this goes beyond tainted weed. And yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot to. But you're right. It's 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 a heinous operation going on within the nation. Um, and certainly want to let your listeners and, and viewers know if anyone has questions on this stuff or being a game warden is a career, or want to learn more about it or want copies of the book or a signature knife or just want to follow my Instagram stuff. As far as these updates and these education pieces, um, reach out to me anytime. I take direct messages all day long. Um, we're mentoring a lot of young adults into getting into conservation and green line jobs. And that is just a blessing, a privilege to do. And you're helping with that by by putting the word out, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, no worries at all. And and just just to be clear on all of this stuff, like the cost of, of this stuff, um, you know, people that have died from fentanyl intoxication are Prince. I think Whitney Houston is just tied to that. Uh, Tom Petty. Yeah. These are people that could legitimately still be with us, you know, but they got a hold of something that was tainted with fentanyl, and it Mac Miller. Mac Miller's a young kid. Yep. And he's dead as hell Crazy. because of fentanyl. Yeah. And and not this is yeah. not because they were doing things that would give them an overdose. They were they were ingesting something that they had no idea what was in it and it literally it killed right. them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean just like that. Um think of how many law enforcement officers handling this stuff even with PPE equipment on yeah. that are getting, you know, getting dosed by by an overdose of fentanyl in a drug seizure. 
We're seeing videos of that up on Instagram. I'm hearing from allied agencies all over the country that are dealing with this, especially in the Midwest. And this is all, the cartel have found another great market in making this fentanyl because the demand in America is here. So they're in that and they're not making clean fentanyl, (laughs) you know, just like they're not making clean weed, man. The, The cartels are not organic they're uh you know by any means and they don't really care about human health they just want that profit and at the expense of lives and that's no exaggeration so um it's something we we'll look at a lot deeper nationally and, and pay attention to what we're what we're buying and ingesting if we're if we're consuming on that black market yeah yeah it's a uh... <laughs> We dug into part two of our episode already. It's uh, we can continue <laughs> to go on in that because it again it's part of this whole system. And you have folks and and when we make fun of uh, President Trump for going after MS thirteen, but there's a lot of reality on the ground that like these folks are really out there. They're really causing problems. And uh, you know if we don't take it seriously, if we get more than twelve of you for the third biggest state, I mean I can't imagine there's nobody. Well I guess Alaska is pretty hard to grow things in. But either way though. Twelve right. is just not enough. You know, there's no way to keep it, up. It, it, it's it's not enough. And you know, when you when you start to look at the pictures of hidden war of stuff going on and how heinous these poisons are and what these bad guys look like, you know, in the foothills of say Silicon Valley, you know, on a wildlife refuge in Ohio, you know, down in the southwest somewhere, up in Oregon or Washington as an example, it's mind blowing and it it's scary. You know, when when Americans read the new book or hear a podcast and, and watch you and I talking about this stuff. They're like, is that really happening? Yeah. Um, I, I can't believe this. And when I, when we launched the book last April at the NRA annual and Oliver North is a, one of the primary endorsers of the book and all took the time to read the book and his busy schedule. And you, you, we know what his career was all about. And he's a hunter and conservationist and loves wildlife. And his statement to me, Pete, you no, know, was crazy. He goes, John, as much as I dedicate my military career in, in, in you know, trying to keep that, that foreign, issue out on the drug front or whatever look i can't believe this happening to this depth in america and it's killing me to get this out we need to get this message out so that was cool to push the message but i would have figured someone like that would have known more about it and it it gets to what our administrators really know how deeply are they vetted in the actual data that's going on with the human trafficking issue tainted cannabis everything else these groups are doing so um we need to keep pushing it we need to keep adding we need to keep adding effort to stop it for sure yeah yeah, there are 27 counties in California, and <laughs> one of them, San Bernardino, is basically the size of ah, – Indiana's probably got a few uh, 10,000 miles on it, but it's basically the size, size of Indiana if you cut 10,000 square miles off of it. It's it's an enormous county, and 12 people can't right? cover 27 yep. of these things. There's no way. There's no way. All right, man. Well, listen, thank you very much. I really appreciate you. And uh, let's come back and do another one soon. Yeah, we need we need we need help so we can spread it. Have on, and we'll, we'll look forward to talking to you again. And stay safe through this mess. Yeah, you too, man. <laughs>